What is up, guys? Welcome back to Reject Films. Back with another Warner Archive review for you guys. It's been uh, a little bit since I did one. Last one I did was uh, for Demon Seed. I've been kind of on a roll with the Vinegar Syndrome reviews, and I will continue to do those as well. I've had this one for a little while and uh, been meaning to get to it, so I do apologize if anybody from Warner Archive is watching. Uh, my apologies, and uh, yeah, finally checked it out, and I'll start by saying... I really enjoyed this one, and uh, it wasn't what I thought it was going to be. I thought it was going to be more of a horror comedy for some reason. Not really sure why I was thinking that, but uh, definitely more of a serious film than I was expecting, and uh, more of a romance movie than a horror film, but uh, definitely has horror elements in it. And uh, yeah, overall, I really uh, enjoyed this one. I really cared about the characters and all that, but we'll get more into that here in a minute. Let me go ahead and start by uh, reading the synopsis and stuff to you guys. Here is the uh, cover here and the inside. So let's uh, read the synopsis real quick and then I'll go more into detail of the uh, story and everything. So yeah, 20 years ago a little accident with a guillotine left, uh, guillotine trick left ma magician Duke. Duquesne's wife, on stage assistant without a head, and their uh, baby daughter Cassie without a mother. Now the great Duquesne may have another trick up his sleeve. He dies, leaving Cassie a sizable inheritance as she spends seven nights in his spooky mansion. With a fearless young reporter by her side, Cassie braves tears that could be the work of evil spirits. Or are they illusions dreamed up by Cassie's dear, demented dad? Connie Stevens, Dean Jones, and Cesar Romero star in a creepy horror fest that offers scares, screams, and a return of the guillotine and Max Steiner's Gone with the Wind uh, score. So, yeah. Uh, so I guess the same guy that did music for Gone with the Wind did uh, the music to this, the score to this. Uh, again, it stars uh, Connie Stevens as Cassie, uh, Cesar Romero as uh, Duquesne, and uh, Dean Jones plays the re uh, reporter Val. And uh, you, you, you guys probably know as well as I do, when I saw the name Cesar Romero, I was pretty excited for this because, as we all know, he played the Joker in the 66 uh, original Batman series, and that's where I know him from the most. And interesting enough, the... Uh, Dean Jones plays Val. He actually did some voice work on a few animated Batman uh, series. So that was kind of interesting. Uh, Connie Stevens, uh, I kind of looked through her profile and just uh, random TV shows and movies, mostly uh, TV shows. Uh, same thing for Dean Jones, seemed to be mostly TV shows made for TV type movies. And uh, the director as well was mainly TV shows. So he only did like a few uh, actual films uh, directed by William Conrad. But uh, yeah, let's go through the synopsis of this real quick <clears throat> and uh, tell you guys a little bit more about the story. And like I said, this is more of a romantic comedy kind of thing or romance in general than a horror film. So you start out with uh, Duquesne and his wife doing uh, a magic trick. I guess just to kind of let you know, hey, this guy's a magician, an illusionist, whatever you will have. And uh, that's pretty much like the only magic trick throughout the movie. And shortly after that, you have uh, Duquesne passing away. And at his funeral, they're putting chains and stuff like that over his uh, coffin. He's got like a see-through coffin. And... He says that he will rise from the grave and all this. And they finally give, uh, read the will to Cassie and uh, everybody. And he leaves, like the back said here, everything to her if she stays these seven nights in his mansion, in his castle. And uh, will also receive like $300,000 or something, which... There's a lot of money nowadays still, but back then that's like an ungodly amount. This uh, took place in like 1965, I think is when this came out. Uh, 64, 65, yeah. So, I mean, 
a lot of money nowadays and definitely a lot of money back then. So shortly after she uh, arrives at the house, uh, she's greeted by a reporter who pretends not to be a reporter, the character of Val, played by that, was it Dean Jones, right? Um, she asks him to leave, you know, she doesn't want anything to do with him. And shortly after he leaves, there's a scare that happens in the house. Cassie's terrified and screams, and he comes running back. Eventually, she gets, uh, he convinces her to let him stay the night and all this kind of stuff. And from there, they kind of uh, tour the house and look through all the rooms and everything, find all the, uh, you know, tricks and everything like that, that her father had around the house and everything. So yeah. Um, and also the beginning of the movie happens and then like very quickly it fast forwards like 20 years later at this point, her mother had been missing. She disappeared, you know, been gone for like 20 years. And, uh, once her and Val are at the house, after they go through all the rooms, all that kind of stuff, they finally go to like a carnival type thing they ride on the ferris wheel they have all this like romance type scenes going on they go to this uh club where everybody's dancing and everything like that and uh you know your you know 60s moves <laughs> your 60s dancing everybody like shaking their shit and all that kind of stuff so after that they get back to the house and everything they hear some, uh, well, there is a part in here too. It's, it's real brief. They hire like a maid. She's there for a little bit. She gets freaked out by the same kind of jump scare that, uh, Cassie encountered when she arrived of the skeleton, uh, coming out and everything. But, uh, they end up taking her to the bus stop and getting rid of her pretty quick. That seemed kind of unnecessary to me. It didn't seem like it really even needed to be in the movie. I don't know. It was just like a really brief amount of time. Uh, for this character to be there for no real reason, I guess. Um, shortly after that, you hear some screams from another woman who is uh, Dolly, who is one of the other main characters in here. So you basically have Cassie, Val. Uh, Duquesne's not even really in uh, the movie very much. Cesar Romero's character, her father, uh, and uh, you know the Dolly character. So once they find Dolly... Uh, she's kind of like the woman who took care of her dad, helped out, you know, kind of watched Cassie when she was a baby, everything like that. And uh, once they find her, Dolly tells her about, you know, her mother's disappearance and kind of like her father's descent into madness. And it was like a long span, you know, these 20 years or so of him just kind of secluding himself into this house. He He wasn't doing, you know, his magic shows or anything like that. He was just... You know, torn up so badly about uh, the dis disappearance of his wife, uh, Melinda, and uh, the resemblance to uh, his wife and his daughter is really, really uh, similar com considering it's played by the same person, um, which I already forgot her name. <laughs> Connie Stevens plays, you know, the mother and the daughter in this movie, so um, there is that going on as well. But, uh, yeah, it's more of a, a film about this, this father losing his wife, not knowing where she is. And you come to find out something later, which I'll get to, but, um, yeah. And not being able to cope with it very well, you know, he just completely shuts down and he just doesn't know what to do. So, uh, moving on from that. Eventually, another reporter comes to the house and kind of blows Val's cover as not being a reporter. He says he's, like, in real estate with, like, his uncle or some something like that. Um, so she doesn't know he's a reporter until this other guy comes and, you know, blows his cover. She gets pretty upset, kind of asks him to leave and everything. So he leaves, and then uh, she goes to sleep, Cassie does, and she starts having really weird dreams, uh kind of like hallucinating type, I, I don't know, they're just really crazy dreams, uh, she gets up, there's this room that's, uh, locked earlier on in the film, and only her father has the key and was buried with it, there was only one key, and, uh, the Dolly character tells, you know, uh, her and Val that 
he was buried with that key. You can't get in that room. She's never, or she knows what's in there. Dolly knows what's in there, but she's not allowed to say. And uh, when she wakes up from her dream, that room is now open. She sees uh, the guillotine in there and opens a, a coffin and screams and everything like that. And she's freaking out. She calls Val, wants him to come back. Of course, he does. And then after that, at Cassie sees her father in the house, and it was brought up by Dolly earlier on that she had seen him, and they all think, you know, she's full of shit. It was, you know, she's seeing things, or, you know, it's one of his cardboard cutouts, or, you know, they don't believe Dolly. And then uh, Cassie says that she sees him, uh, tells Val and everything. After that, uh, Cassie finds out that her father staged his whole death and everything, you know, faked his own death to try to bring her back, but in essence, he was actually trying to bring uh, Melinda back, not Cassie. Um, but there was uh, things brought up to where uh, he had written Cassie letters, and I think it was her aunt or something like that that she was living with, uh, sent them back, so she never knew, and he thought he was uh, uh, she was ignoring him, and the whole time she wasn't. She didn't know he was trying to contact her, and Dolly tells uh, Duquesne that, you know, Melinda's not missing. She's she's dead. She died from uh, the guillotine trick going wrong, and he doesn't want to accept that. He doesn't believe her, and he really thinks Cassie is Melinda. He's convinced of it, and after that, uh, Duquesne puts uh, Cassie on the guillotine and tries to set her up for this trick and everything. At that point, uh, Duquesne and Val uh, start fighting, uh, and this whole time that uh, before before they start fighting, uh, Duquesne thinks he's like in this um, like has an audience and everything. He thinks this is like a real show, and uh, I forget exactly what Val says, but he says something to kind of distract him uh, right before the fight, telling him that. You know, he needs to do something different because people can't see the trick right or something like that. And, you know, he has it in his mind that he is actually performing this trick. And once they start fighting, uh, after well, after the fight's over, that's when Val kind of hits into the guillotine and chops off Cassie's head. And Cassie's fucking dead. No. Actually, the trick works. And Cassie's fine. She's got her head underneath, you know, like they do the guillotine tricks and had the wax head and everything. After that, the movie just kind of ends. It doesn't really give you a whole lot of closure on everything. Uh, but Cassie's okay. Duquesne's alive. Uh, you know, nobody uh, died in this movie except for his wife from the guillotine trick, you know, 20 years prior. Uh, so you do find out you know, that it, that was all legit, you know, Dolly was telling the truth, there is another character in here, I can't remember his name, he kind of works alongside Dolly, but I think he was kind of cricket, he was kind of like, always taking from Duquesne, and everything like that, he's kind of like a drunk, and everything, but there's not a whole lot of interaction with him, so I didn't really bring him up, uh, because he's not really that relevant to the story, but uh, it's pretty small cast, you know, four or five people involved with this, um, and all pretty much in the one location of the uh, house, castle, mansion, whatever you want to call it. Um, but yeah, the end just kind of left me wanting a little bit more. Um, I mean, the, the movie was long enough, but I think they spent a little bit more time than they should have with like the romance side of things between uh, Cassie and Val. So they could have done a little bit less that and a little bit more story of Duquesne and Cassie, Melinda, that, that little triangle there of him uh, not being able to decipher between the two. And, uh, you know, thinking that she is her and everything. So, yeah, the end could have been a little bit better. But overall, I really enjoyed this film, guys. I thought it was actually really well done. There's a few cuts here and there that aren't great. It could have been a little bit better editing-wise. Uh, and some definite, you know, uh, fake backdrops when they're on the uh, Ferris wheel and everything. Um, you know, this might have been a little creepy back in 65 when it came out. Uh, of course, now it's just, you know, cheesy, whatever. But overall, the acting was actually really good. I think everybody in this movie did a really good job. And, you know, it's good to see Cesar Romero in this role. I think he did a really good job as Duquesne. And, uh, 
even for the short amount of time he was in it. I mean, he was only in it at the beginning. There's like some like flashback type scenes of him. And then, you know, he's there at the end. But he's really only at the beginning and the end of this film. So if you're expecting a movie that has a lot of him in it, this isn't going to be one uh, that he's in a lot of. But, uh, yeah, overall, I really enjoyed this film, guys. I really suggest checking this one out. I'm not, like, the biggest fan of black and white films. Of course, you know, Night of Living Dead is, you know, just a classic. And, you know, everybody loves that movie. But, uh... They're kind of starting to grow on me a little bit more as I've gotten more and more from Warner Archive. You know, watched uh, The Thing from Another World and stuff like that. And I don't really mind them as much as I used to, especially as I'm getting older. And uh, there's some real fine acting in some of these older films as well. And people were more uh, gentlemen and ladies and nowadays, <laughs> you know. Uh, it was just uh, it was a different culture back then. So... Again, I recommend this one, guys. If you're kind of on the fence about it, definitely wait till like one of the four for forty four sales, which they have quite often. Um, if it sounds like something up your alley, definitely grab it. And uh, beautiful transfer from Warner Archive. There is like no features on here. I think there's just a trailer, and that's pretty standard with the archive titles. That's been my only complaint with uh, the archive releases is the lack of special features. I mean. A slipcover would be nice, yes. A booklet would be nice, yes. But features, I mean, at least like some kind of uh, commentary by like some film historians. Because a lot of these movies are older films. A lot of the actors are going to be uh, passed away and everything by the time, you know, they release the film. But, uh, you know, you can do some archival interviews probably or, you know, uh, something. Like I said, film historian uh, commentaries or, uh, retrospectives of the film or, uh, hell you could throw on like a Cesar Romero, uh, timeline or something, you know, other films he was in or, you know, just like have somebody talking about the movie or, you know, something, I, I don't know. But a lot of times all you get is a trailer, but the transfers are always top notch. I will say that about Warner archive and they released some really good titles. Um, if not for reviewing for them, there's a lot of movies that I've seen I otherwise would not have seen. But uh, I go through and I read the synopsis of a lot of them. I watch the trailers, and if they look interesting, you know, I try to request them. And, uh, you know, this was a, a newer release at the time, and it sounded pretty interesting. Like I said, I don't know why I thought it was a, a horror comedy, I guess, by the cover or something. I'm not really sure. But, uh, wouldn't you like to learn how to flip your lid? If you're chopping for entertainment, here's the super shocker of them all, is the uh, tagline down there. But uh, like I said, the transfer, audio, video quality, uh, really, really good. So if you guys are a fan of this film already and you're looking for something that has a great transfer, this is definitely the way to go. I'm not sure if this is available on Blu-ray. Uh, aside from the archive, I, I didn't really look up to see if any other countries had released it or anything. So um, yeah. Definitely recommend this one, guys. If this sounds like something that you're interested in, definitely grab it. If you're kind of on the fence, again, wait till the 4 for 44 sell. But uh, I think it's one definitely worth adding to the collection for sure. Uh, if you guys are just fans of film in general, I think you'll enjoy it. Yeah, It's not a scary movie by any means. Uh, like I said, back in that day, it might have been. This did get a 6.1 on IMDb. And uh, I'm... If I had to rate it, I'd probably be right there about a seven for me because I just I thought the acting was definitely really good and uh, I, I really like the character of Dolly too because she was just kind of crazy and uh, she uh, Val thought uh, Dolly was trying to convince Cassie uh, of certain things going on in the house that weren't so that she would uh, not stay in the house because if Dolly didn't stay in the house. Uh, Dolly was like next in line to get the inheritance and everything, but we find out that that's not true. She wasn't, you know, trying to sabotage her or anything. So, uh, I, I forgot to mention that earlier, but that is one of the plot lines as well. So, uh, just, just a good film all the, all, all the way around guys. And, uh, really enjoy this one. So thank you again, Warner Archive for sending this one out. And, uh, that's going to do it for this review guys. Uh, thanks for watching. Peace, love, happiness as always, and I'll catch you guys next time. Take care. Bye.